I am like all voters and speaking at the District 200 School Board. This is such a single Mrs. Bradford? Here. Mrs. Harrison? Here. Mr. Gambiani? Here. Mr. Hanlon? Here. Mr. Madison? Here. Mr. Fawcett? Here. Mr. Grauman? Here. Mr. Snow, I understand we've been led to Pledge of Allegiance. Austin. 
All right, next up we have our student council representatives. The student council welcomes the school board to Lowell. I'm Sienna Keith and this is Sophie Von Dresen. We are in fifth grade. Student council is great and a lot of fun. There are 14 representatives from fourth and fifth grade this year. We are looking forward to planning projects this year as well. Last year was a really great year. Student council helped pick up trash around the local school. We also made making cards for the people who live around the local school. We also did Feed My Starving Children for people in Africa who don't get a lot of food. We also raised money for a buddy bench. A buddy bench is where you sit at at recess if you don't have anyone who can play with it. And someone will see you sitting there and invite you to play with them. We also raised money for water in South Sudan. We did crowd serve South sourcing from the community to help on this too. One last thing we did is we supported school events on the January. This year we cannot wait to help support Lowell School's 100th anniversary celebrations and much more. Lowell is a great place to be in student council. Thank you, Mrs. Melton. Thank you, students. Um, next item on the agenda, uh, modifications to the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda any more than we just proposed? Hearing none, we go to recognition and achievements. Dr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Broman. Uh, we have a special and, and I think a little different uh, introduction or recognition uh, this evening than, uh, than what we've done in the, in the past. So uh, as the Board of Education knows, um, regularly at your meetings, we thank those that partner with the district, especially those that work extremely hard to help us raise and bring resources into the school that support the, the efforts. And um, as you get to your consent agenda this evening, you're gonna see another example of that through the Whittier PTA. But one of the other organizations um, that has in the last uh, number of years really gone through a significant rebirth, uh, kind of in its effort to uh, support District 200 is the Student Excellence Foundation. Um, they've done an incredible job uh, in bringing uh, not only direct resources into the district, but uh, also in, in bringing just human capital support to the district. And so I want to introduce Jennifer Merck, who I think is going to come up and, and share with the board a very exciting development in kind of the, the next step that the foundation is taking in its effort to support District 200 and our students. So Jennifer. Thank you. I'm Jennifer Merck, a District 200 resident for the past 33 years. Uh, for the past 17 years I've been preparing for the district. I currently serve as Vice President of the Student Excellence Foundation, and I have a very exciting announcement to share with the Board of Education this evening. The Student Excellence Foundation Board of Directors is excited to announce that Lisa Bella has joined the foundation as its first ever executive director. A 27-year resident of Wheaton, that he brings an in-depth knowledge and love of this community where she raised her family. Vicki previously served as the Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce. Under her leadership, the Chamber experienced unprecedented exponential growth in community visibility. In addition to helping launch the Downtown Wheaton Business Association, Vicki served on the City of Wheaton Plan Commission and the Comprehensive Planning and Development Committee. She was a member of the Wheaton Lions and Quantas Club, for whom she chaired the Safety City Club. Vicki has also served on the Wheaton History Center Board of Directors, and many will remember reading her weekly column, The Wheaton Happenings, in local newspapers, as well as feature stories and her coverage of the District School Board and the Page County Board. In her position as Executive Director, Vicki will work closely with the Foundation Board of Directors in oversight of its fundraising and grant programs, which support its mission to engage the community to enrich educational experiences that empower students to reach their greatest potential. This new position is fully funded through the Student Excellence Foundation, which, as you know, is a local not for profit serving as the Education Foundation for District 200. Since 1992, the foundation has granted funds for new projects and teaching methods that enhance and enrich the educational experience of students. And I hope that you'll join me in welcoming Mrs. Well. Well, I just wanted to say that my family and I know what it is to have benefited from school's 
And now, to be able to come alongside and work with the Group of Women's Team Excellence Foundation, who are part of first group people. It's pretty amazing to see this all come full in the community that I just saw. So I appreciate what you guys have partnered with us to do and for what we are doing. One quick comment. I, I've had the pleasure of working with Vicki in the past as, through the Chamber of Commerce and, and a couple of the other organizations. She's, uh, 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 I'm truly pleased that we have this opportunity to have our first executive director in such a good way. So, thank you. Thanks, Jim, for the comments. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Vicki. Uh, we will now move to public comment. We have no public comments. Well, I'll make a comment for the staff that are here. You're welcome to stay through the entire meeting tonight. We'd love to have you here, but if you have other things to do than rather than sit here and listen to us, please feel free to leave. So. Um. <laughs> yeah, so Joyce is taking up on an offer. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is the superintendent report, Dr. Schiller. Mr. Broman, uh, we, we actually the uh, the staff, I know, have certainly uh, put in a full day. We actually started our day here at Lowell Elementary uh, at a staff meeting and a sharp focus meeting with the, the staff. So we saw them as they got into the building and are seeing them certainly now uh, at the, the end of the day. A couple of things that I wanted to share with the board this evening under my, my report. Um, one, actually two that are connected. Um, so there are a couple of items that we identified uh, both in our new strategic plan and in in our, our communication, our community engagement plan to the end of last year um, that we've given you a copy of in your green folders um, this evening. One is you have a little stack of these little business cards uh, that are titled, titled Connect With Us uh, in District 200. So um, I found as I've moved throughout the community and opportunities to visit with, to meet with groups, and, and as we get to talking about topics relative to District 200, um, I'll, I'll almost always get one comment from somebody going, wow, I didn't hear about that. I sure would have loved to have heard about that. And so that always leads us to, hey, do you, do you, you get our Friday focus or our newsletter pieces? And so we develop these little business cards so that any time you interact with a community member or group uh, within the community that says, gee, I sure would love to stay connected to District 200, all you have to do is hand them one of these little cards and it tells them how to sign up for our newsletter, how to follow our social media uh, feeds, as well as how to get to our newsroom where all of uh, information relative to District 200 is uh, shared. And, and I have uh, started as of, uh, of recent just bringing a stack of these with me to any group that I meet with to simply um, not, not only pass along, but, but give each person two to say, share this with, uh, with somebody else. So we've given you a little stack uh, of them. I would encourage you to do the same. Uh, and please know that at any point if you run out of these or you know you're going to a community event or engagement where you need a stack of them, all you have to do is let, uh, let, let me know, let Erica know, and um, we'll get you a stack of these. The second thing that uh, we're giving you kind of a first draft of this evening uh, is uh, it's what we've, we've called a community calendar. Uh, and so as we have continued to work to engage, uh, especially our senior population, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we put together for them was a calendar of opportunities that we would love to have people come to, to District 200. So the calendars are organized by our two high schools and really highlights um, anytime there's a concert, there's a musical event, there's something that certainly is open to the public and, and we, we've made a specific effort to reach out to some of, uh, of our concentrated um, senior populations to give them copies of this and also encourage them if they have the opportunity to perhaps bring a bus uh, or you know one of their smaller vans with residents. All they have to do is let us know, and we'll make sure that some seating is available for them at uh, at events. So again, we we have this an eight and a half by eleven size. I know 
uh, in uh, Erica's office. We've also got some kind of larger, kind of almost poster-sized ones that we're going to move out and about uh, in the <clears throat> in the community. And, and again, our, our thought was we've got phenomenal opportunities for our community to interact with, see the, the talents that our kids have. So this was kind of the first effort at putting together a, a community calendar, and we'll see how that goes. So uh, again, feel free to pass this on, or if you know of uh, any, any group that would benefit from this calendar, we can certainly get you more of them as well. Um, wanted to mention uh, that uh, as we, we move forward through the next couple of weeks, one of the things that uh, you're going to see Dr. Kyle uh, working on um, is some data gathering around our next proposed two-year school calendar. So uh, the, the board uh, a little over a year ago passed the two-year uh, calendar, and I, I see the smiles and the giggles around the, uh, the table because uh, you know the fun that uh, setting a school calendar uh, has the, uh, the ability to, to bring, but um, we are going to, what we're working on right now uh, is an, another survey that uh, will we'll move on to the community. And, and I think one of the things that I just want to highlight or mention to the, to the board is that um, a lot of the questions that will get asked through the survey will probably mirror questions we asked kind of in the last go around. But the one interest around calendar that we've had, we've heard, um, but are struggling to, to kind of find the ability to reconcile is the whole question about could we complete finals before uh, winter break? We never, though, ask questions sort of in, in relation, meaning when we ask folks, you know, do you like the weekend Thanksgiving? Yes, of course. Do you like the two-week winter break? Yes, of course. But is it worth reconsidering a few of those calendar parameters in light of Right, that decision around uh, finals. We're going to ask some questions specifically this time, really trying to, to, to gauge the degree to which there is any consistent feedback out in the community, and, and there may be, there may not be, but I'm, I'm just sharing with the board that at least that survey is going to go out, and our intention would be to, uh, to likely try to draft the calendar by October that we'll bring back to the, to the board for posting. Um, we do also have a citizens advisory committee, the first one coming up next week, and, and that's one of the topics that we've done to that agenda as well, just to talk about that community input process going into the uh, to the calendar as we, uh, we bring that to you. So um, again, just heads up, calendar conversation, the coming. Um, uh, Two other things that I wanted to mention uh, quickly this evening, because I, I had a, a couple of questions on this today. There was, uh, there was an article in, in one of our local papers uh, today that uh, talked about um, uh, one of the new provisions that came about through the new school funding formula and, and a few uh, area communities that have the ability to perhaps contemplate a, a referendum that would force uh, or drive a conversation around reduction uh, of the, the, the tax base into a school district. So I just wanted to clarify because question was asked. That provision with the school funding formula was put in place only for school districts whose available funding is at 110% or higher of their adequacy target uh, that was set through the, the new state funding formula. So just by way of reminder, relative to District 200, when that went into play a year ago, we were right at 90% of our adequacy target. We've moved up a smidge this year, I think 92%, is that right, uh, uh, Bill? So um, just as you see that, or perhaps get questions about that, that that provision relative to referendum is only available to districts that are north of 110% of their adequacy target. Um, we are uh, a ways away from that, and, and I was uh, having a conversation with our, our PTA council today kind of uh, around some of those issues, and again, really just reminded them, as I'll remind the, the board, congratulations for the, the, the job that you're doing, because again, as you look at those variables, both about results that we're delivering and the results that we're delivering certainly for what I think is, uh, is is a very fair investment for the community. You can't put the variables together much better than, than District 200 is. You are delivering a very high quality education for an investment that is very, very fair 
uh, in, in terms of, uh, of what's going into this system. So I, I wanted to share those two pieces now. Um, and then the final thing uh, under the report, the, my report this evening, I just wanted to remind the board that um, we are actively working on our information campaign uh, relative to the November referendum question. So um, we've been working on, on an initial information piece uh, that um, should go out uh, very soon uh, to the community. The Community Engagement Committee is meeting next week. One of the things that the Community Engagement Committee will do is look at the balance of the activities around uh, our information campaign, which will likely include one more information piece that the, the district will push out along with um, some of our electronic uh, communications that, that will go out and the resource of some frequently asked questions that we've begun to develop and will maintain along with uh, our social media uh, push out or, or campaign. So um, we, we've been working certainly big picture on the overall strategy and that's something we're going to work on. Um, certainly with uh, the, uh, the uh, Community Engagement Committee next week as we map through the, the rest of that. And, and I, I think I've shared or mentioned to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to the board and that, that piece, a, a big part of the messaging around the, the uh, I think the work that we're doing in addition to obviously the important concepts relative to Jefferson to the building um, is that uh, I think it's important that we do continue to remind, remind the community of the way that we've worked hard to collaborate with them on the future of our schools to make sure that we're reducing costs, being fiscally responsible in delivering a quality education, but yet still providing uh, our kids with a 21st century education with you, which you absolutely are. So those are kind of uh, core tenets to, uh, to the message that we're working on. So uh, that's all I have. Any questions or comments uh, for Dr. Schuller? Jim? Yeah, uh, just to clarify a couple things. Number one on the calendar, if we are not contractually bound by any of the things, such as a week at uh, uh, Thanksgiving or anything, that's not part of the contract, is it? Uh, there are not specific parameters in the contract of what we can or we can't do. There's just language on how the, the process of developing the calendar. Uh, secondarily, you, you, about the funding concept uh, that we, you know, was again in the paper today, but basically it was saying that available funding has to be above a certain standard that the state has established, and if it exceeds 110% of that state standard, then the community has the right to uh, request a referendum to reduce the tax rate. And that number is again 100% of the state standard of spending. And the the and it's the percent of what you mentioned available funding. What is available funding? So those are funds that are available through our local property tax levy and monies that we are already receiving from the state of Illinois or federal government. So um, total available resources to the school district. So that says that we're operating our district at. 90% of the state standard. I mean, is that is that a fair statement? It's a, a 90% certainly of that that adequacy target that the state has set specifically for District 200. And, and just by way of quick clarification to that, the adequacy target varies across school districts because while it's based on some common assumptions of high leverage practices within school districts that drive costs. Um, there are some factors relative to our specific student population, the students that we're serving, the needs that that student population has that drives cost as well as some regional allowances based on what part of the state that you live in. So, so basically, again, we are not even close to that type of a problem, or problem I know, the tax reduction. And, and again, I want to be clear that this referendum that's coming up in November is does not change that that revenue source to make us from 90 to 100 or anything like that because we're not raising any new tax. Is that correct? Okay. Um, I, I one follow-up question that or comment to that is that I've been seeing some circulation on data or you know unsigned data about the referendum and uh, you know, no 
nobody puts their name on it or they make up a fake name. And they, they make misleading statements, such as over the next five years, the school district will spend $100 million, you know, or what, $500 million. You know, meaningless things that, you know, is running our business. And, you know, I, I encourage everyone to, again, you know, if, if you get any document that doesn't have a name or a valid entity on it, don't even look at it. Because it's just, it's complete garbage trying to, trying to misguide the community. And it's so disappointing that we have people like that who, I don't care if they object to the problem, but if they can't stand up and say who they are objecting, that's, a, that's embarrassing to me. And I think there's some of that starting already. And I, it really, you know, takes away the, what we talked about here is social and emotional learning. You know, so I really would encourage all to see anything like that and you know, spread the word as best we can. Thank you. And that emphasizes with the referendum coming up, we have a responsibility as a board to, when we're speaking as a board member or on behalf of the board, um, to provide only objective facts that relate to the referendum. We cannot promote it personally, I mean, as a board member or as a board. Uh, we can't argue against it either. Um, so that's our role, it's just to present uh, facts, that uh, verifiable facts that relate to the referendum. Uh, next time, if I start getting that way, you know, press the button and cut it off. Right? All right. Moving on <clears throat> to the consent agenda. Following items on the consent agenda. One, acceptance of gifts from Whittier Elementary School PTA. Two, approval to add serious safety hazard bus routes. Three, approval of annual vendor contracts generating revenue. Four, approval of bills payable and payroll. Five, approval of minutes August 15, 2018, open and closed, August 20, 2018, special meeting. And approval to destroy recordings of closed sessions prior to April 2017 as allowable by law. And six, approval of personnel report to include employment, resignation, retirement, and leave of absence of administrative, certified, classified, and non union staff. Are there any items board members want to remove from the consent agenda? Dr. Schuller? Just two quick comments. One, uh, again, huge thank you to Whittier uh, Elementary PTA. Um, the board sees a uh, $16,000 donation from, uh, from that school, so I guess we can also thank uh, Ms. Dr. Salagi. It's probably his uh, parting work with me at the PTA and bringing those opportunities uh, forward, but again, very thankful to the PTA for uh, uh, the, the generous uh, donation. Second thing that I just wanted to mention uh, related to an item, so the, the board's approving the, the personnel report this evening, and I have a couple of questions, um, not necessarily about approvals on the report, but just about the status of open positions within the, the district. And so um, we are fully staffed in terms of our certified positions uh, within the district, our teaching uh, and certified positions. We are not fully staffed when it comes to instructional assistance. Uh, we, we are candidly struggling uh, to, to fill those positions and uh, certainly uh, Dr. Kyle and the Human Resource Office and our principals are working hard to uh, put in place some recruitment strategies to, uh, to address that, but, but I, I just wanted to make the board aware that uh, it's not unusual to start a school year with some open positions, right, that we're, we're still trying to, to fill, but uh, that this is beyond what, what is the, the norm in terms of uh, open positions right now, which, uh, again, I think kind of has, uh, at its core, a job market that's tightening up uh, a, a little bit in terms of uh, having an available uh, pool to, to draw from. The board certainly has heard. I've sent you some resources that um, candidly that highlight, I think, uh, a looming teacher shortage that's making its way uh, out to us. And again, when those variables sit out there, we, we will also see that pinch in other areas, certainly instructional assistants, substitute teachers, some of, uh, of those other temp positions. So it's not, not a discussion for tonight, but I just wanted to mention to the board, kind of get it on your radar, that um, we see it, we're putting some strategies in place to try to address it, but I think uh, we're gonna certainly need to be more proactive moving forward in how 
uh, we, we deal with what I think is, uh, is a little shortage. So, contractually, we have two years left on that contract after this year, or how much time do we have? Two years. Oh, Dr. Cox, same two. Two? Two years. The reason that I ask um, is because it has been brought to my attention, most of our surrounding school districts, starting salaries for those positions are significantly higher than us. So, I have a feeling that might be also a play out there as well as a, a, you know, a short, shorter pool and, and higher starting salary, so I was curious on that. And that's classified state, right? Question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. When we met, probably a year ago, I believe, uh, on this topic, we knew where we were on that scale. And we did a little, made a little effort, but we made a decision to not move that scale up. And I, I think we're seeing the ramifications of that decision. And not that it was wrong, it just is the choice we made and the ramifications of it. I think we just need to remember that, that every time we look at a contract, a compensation contract, there's a choice we make and there's ramifications of it, both positive and negative. In this case, we're seeing a negative ramification. And, you know, I think that's a very good thing to remember as we're talking through contracts. Um, we deal with the market, not politics of a compensation contract. We deal with the market, whether it's a teacher's market, a staff market, a assistance market, and you know that market speaks pretty quickly when your compensation plan is not aligned to it. So I think that's one point. Any other comments or questions for Dr. Stewart? Uh, just going to follow up on Rob's comment. The, um, if we look at that and we get some factual evidence of price uh, you know, compensational differences that are, you know, causing us not to be able to hire people. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see them follow up with what impact or that differential would have on, on how, you know, on the total cost of, of uh, servicing what we need. And, and I guess the other follow-up question is, do we feel that the shortage now is so significant that it's going to affect the educational process? And uh, so Jim, we're working hard to make sure that that's not the case, but but bottom line is, if we've got open positions and they're not filled, if it's not impacting the system in some way, then then we don't need those positions, right? So uh, uh, we, we certainly are cognizant of making sure that highest priority is addressed, certainly within buildings. Um, just the fact that there's an open position doesn't mean that the position's not being temporarily, temporarily covered. Right, and in some other way, they may also have a, have a resource impact. So it's not that there are necessarily just a ton of open positions and students that are going without service, but, but it means that certainly our principals are doing a lot of daily scrambling to kind of help fill, cover, and triage. And, and again, in the big picture, so separate from all the discussions around compensation, models, and market, and all of that is, uh, we also want our principals spending time where our principals should be spending time, and, and so this is just adding a layer into uh, that piece as well. But no, it does not mean that we are leaving major shortages or kind of issues within buildings. We wouldn't do that. If there are no more questions or comments, I'll ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Moved by Mrs. Crabtree. Second. Second. Second by Mrs. Erickson. Mrs. Hutchison, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mrs. Erickson? Yes. Mr. Gambiani? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Madison? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Girl? Yes. The consent agenda is passed. We now move to action items. The one action item we have tonight is the approval of a resolution to adopt the 2018 19 Thank you, Mr. Bowman. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Farley, but uh, do that just by, by way of reminding the, the board that, well, tonight is the final action uh, on your budget. Um, as the board is well aware, and I want to make sure that the community is well aware, the development of this budget you're approving tonight actually reflects about six months of work that the board has done actively building the components within the the budget, a, a budget that serves uh, a, a kind of 
from a school district whose complexity of District 200 doesn't just come together in a couple of weeks of, uh, of pulling data together. So it starts back in January, candidly, where you approve a resolution to begin development of that, that budget. Uh, there are a lot of decisions that go into fine-tuning the elements and getting it to uh, the, the point where it, it is. So when we say or when we share with the community that uh, we, we are in, you know, X consecutive, I think our ninth consecutive year of presenting and approving a balanced budget, that doesn't just happen uh, through kind of a simple act of, uh, of putting variables together. So I want to thank the board for that, um, but I also want to thank Mr. Farley for it, and I'm going to turn it over to him with uh, kind of any final comments here on approval. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. This is the end of the process that we outlined uh, back when we posted the budget. Uh, the budget has to be approved by the first quarter or September 30th. Um, as Dr. Schuler mentioned, the budget is balanced. It's right there on the front page in the document uh, that the, balance, the budget is balanced. And uh, as I think Mr. Paulson mentioned when we posted the budget, this is the ninth consecutive year of a balanced budget. Uh, so tonight we're asking the board, uh, since we've posted it, had a public hearing and um, final step here to approve the budget uh, for the 2018-19 school year. And I would answer any questions if there are any. Bill, can you comment on just two things really quickly before we entertain uh, questions? So I think there was a, a question from a board member about where in the budget is the projected payment for the early learning center? So again, if that referendum is approved in November, where is the payment for that building found within the budget as well as any other capital project work that the board did this summer? Sure. Uh, the anticipated lease payment would be found in the debt services fund and, and so as well as the associated revenue to support that lease payment of a million dollars. Um, the payment for the actual work is in the uh, capital projects fund along with a million dollars that the board uh, approved in July and transfer over to uh, support the secure entry projects at uh, seven of the eight schools and so um, that is found in the capital projects fund. We also, um, just for the sake of comparison, because I think the question was asked as well, um, for the FY18 budget, the board had committed about $2.6 million in our operations and maintenance fund and had $398,000 of uh, committed fund balance for a little bit over $3 million in the FY18 budget towards capital work. Uh, this year, we've got about $3.2 million in the operations and maintenance fund with that million-dollar transfer for the secure entry work as well. So that's about $4.2 million. So obviously, increasing not only the operating funds that were uh, attributed to capital work this summer, but also um, um, also a commitment of fund, an additional commitment of fund balance as well. I think I probably just stole GR's first slide of his presentation, but I want to make sure that the board, uh, the commitment to addressing the capital projects and uh, the high priority um, projects like the secure entries was, uh, was obviously addressed this summer. So just to clarify that, I just have to remind myself. <clears throat> so the money that's in this budget for capital work is for the work we just finished this summer, right? So as we're beginning through the facility committee and then eventually the finance committee to plan for what we're going to do next summer, we're making decisions based on projected assumptions that we're going to have and be approving in the budget next year. So that's the importance of the five-year financial plan that we look at every February, January, it's close. So uh, we're making decisions based on some projected assumptions down the road. I'd like to make a couple of comments on the budget. And there's a, one of the detailed schedules attached is uh, it shows the form. And if we look at page two of the form, I just want to kind of review that. Um, if anybody's there, we can get to page two and then be the second uh, spot. Yeah, that form, go down to that, that summer page. So, you know, just basically what that's saying is we have an estimated fund balance in the education fund of about $10 million. And that, is that the audited number? Is that the cash number? No, that's the, that's uh, on budget year over budget year. So we, we know that we will be higher. Okay. And that will be based on the accrual. This is, the, it will be a, uh, how can I say this? The, we, we don't have the audited number. So is this number 
accrual basis or cash? I guess is what I'm trying to say. This is cash basis based on what we anticipated the budget coming in from last year. All right. So then we have about 121 million of local. This is the education fund. Uh, you know, total well, 121 of local sources, which is primarily tax revenue, and we have the state money of 14 million, and then federal sources of seven or 143 million. And then right below that, there's the 65 million. What is what is that 65 million? Oh, uh, 65 million, thank you for pointing that out. I'd like to mention that. That's the on behalf payment that the state of Illinois makes for the pension system uh, for the school district. We add that in every year uh, into this document. Um, it actually has gone down. We got the numbers from TRS uh, uh, from uh, year over year, and it went down. We keep it static because it's a, kind of an unknown. It's an uh, actuarial number that the, the state does come up with each year. It's hard to pinpoint what it is. So. Uh, for last fiscal year, the number actually went down a little bit um, over the prior year, so we've kept it flat. So that we do put that in as a uh, uh, on behalf receipt revenue uh, and an expenditure as well. So it never actually technically hits our books, but we are uh, we do carry that in our budget each year. Just to understand that, then, so that's what the state is paying on the pension. So when we talk about if there were a pass through low to you know by the state. To fund local pension costs, funded locally, out of our out of revenues from somewhere, I don't know where, it would be equal to or some portion of that $65 million would be what would be passed on. Is that a percentage of that? Yeah. 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 I mean, there's no current legislation, but you know the impact of that. You can see in the education fund that's almost 32% of the total revenues or expenditures, whatever you want to call it. So that's the exposure we have when we talk about pension pass-through money. So that's a big, big number, obviously. And uh, and then you know again we're budgeting zero or break-even revenue equal expense in the education fund. Uh, in the case of the uh, um, you know basically the same in the operations and maintenance fund. And which which fund, which one of those funds has the it has the uh, if we it assumes we're going to pass the referendum and pay the least payment. Is that correct? Yes, that's in, in capital projects fund 60. Okay. For, for, the, for the expenditures associated with the project, the actual lease payment is in debt service in fund 30. Okay, so. So if we, if we pass that and the debt service fund, the third column over, included in the, well, not in the revenue side, but the expenditure side would be the million dollar lease payment if we went that way. Is that correct? Right. Okay. And that, and that fund basically is pretty even as well, debt service. And the other things in debt service are what? The payment of our our bonds, okay, and then uh, continuing on, we're basically breaking even in transportation. Did that change a lot, or where are we standing now with the? You know, we had a couple years ago where we had a big jump in the uh, uh, cost of operating the uh, buses and so on. Is that is this number significantly different than last year? Uh, as far as the fund being break even, well. Actual expenditures is what I'm So we, we're spending almost nine and a half million dollars on transportation, and that took a big jump two, three years ago, I believe. That's correct. We bid it out and jumped by about 19 percent, um, based on the, the costs associated with finding and staffing bus drivers as the economy got better. Uh, they were having to do significant increases, so we did see an increase. Um, and then it's gone up. Uh, we're in the third, actually, the third year of the contract, so that has gone up over time. Um, state funding has gone up as well, uh, which is uh, somewhat a result of that going up as well. But uh, uh, yes, if you're correct, it has gone up over time. Okay, so we had to put more tax money or something in there to help offset that cost out of the operation, out of the education fund. So. Uh, state funding has caught up a little bit now. Okay, and then the capital projects fund, uh, column H, shows $15 million of expenditures. Uh, with no revenue, what, what, what's, where's the revenue on that? Uh, the other, there's not a, it's not a revenue, but another source of fund would be the uh, lease certificates that would be sold uh, for the Jefferson Early Learning Center for the Childhood Center project, and then one million of uh, other sources was the transfer from uh, fund balance. Okay, so one, and that's in the lower part of that schedule. So that's how we would fund that. So. And, and just to understand again under the third count, the debt service, the principal on bonds sold at twenty-two million uh, five hundred thousand. What is that? So we, we just refinanced. 
That's the principal and interest on our current debt for the fiscal year. Okay, but that, there's a revenue, I believe, there, isn't it? Correct. Okay, isn't that in effect saying we're refinancing debt? That's fine. Below under sale of bonds, if you go down uh, lower on that, the debt service column. Yeah. And what, what, have we done that already, or is that what will happen in the future? That's, that has been recently completed. We closed on the bonds in July. Okay, so that was that first phase refinancing we did, where we got, we lowered our, what, uh, long-term cost about a million dollars in total, and, and leveled out the schedule. So that was one of the decisions made. So overall, we're doing a budget that basically is break even. We don't know really what happened in 2018 yet, uh, but you know, basically from early look, I think we're still looking like we're, we were revenue over expenditure in the operating funds. Is that true? That's correct. And so the questions I have. Any other questions or comments from the board members? Oh, Bill? I just want to mention two things real quick. One is the, uh, we did uh, update an attachment. We got another, uh, as part of the budget, we attached contracts that are, uh, we have uh, in the schools for yearbooks and things like that. We did one school submit so one a little late, so we did include that to the attachment that goes on the budget document. And the second thing is the requirement also of the budget document is that all of you sign uh, after the vote is collected. So to avoid Diana tackling you at the door, uh, just a reminder, please see her that she's got three copies of the budget document that need everyone's signature, not just the board and secretary. Thank you. Yes, Diane asked me to make sure that everybody doesn't leave until you sign that document if we, if we pass the budget tonight. So. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Yes, Fred. So, <clears throat> so nine years in a row of a balanced budget, so that predates all of us sitting at the table. So that's important to know that there's a long history beyond, sorry, beyond our time here that uh, have been successful in financial planning and budgeting of the school district. But this is just kind of the beginning of it. The other end of the performance is, you know, operating within that budget. And I would assume, I think in the next couple of months, we're going to get that lovely reading from our audit, which is going to show us how we did last year. Any early results in terms of um, performance versus our operating budget from last school year, or last fiscal year? You're, you're going to be positive from last year. I don't, I don't want to speculate on you know, the, the number in terms of where revenues came in over expenditures, but you're going to be positive from last year. And there's a, there's a similar re recent history of consistent performance of not only establishing a positive balance budget, but also operating in a positive manner. <coughs> within that budget, so. I think the only exception that was one year when the state did not fund us timely, and we didn't report that revenue in the year which we didn't receive it, and I think that may have caused us to be slightly under uh, revenue, or expenditures exceeding budget slightly in that year. And then, you know, once we caught up with the, I'll call it the five quarterly payments the following year, we were fine, you know, the, the, the race to the, you know, just to make it clear. Bill, correct me. Wasn't there also a year where health insurance was an issue and then we made the change to not self-insure anymore? Same year. And just for clarity around that last piece, um, I would mention, so uh, when your audit comes in based on the policy you have, they, we are still lagging one payment from the state from last fiscal year. So we will come in positive, and that is with still with one outstanding payment that will not get booked for the fiscal year that you just closed out. So that, that lag is still there with just one of the categorical payments. Just one, I will be in my body, just one thing. It came, it came up during the last election. It's very easy to take a look at our spend and go, I can send this up to bid and get 5% savings across the board. And that's just one of those assumptions that isn't valid. And I want to just highlight the work the staff has done, not only the year on the board, but even prior, where we see pressures on our costs, we see increasing uh, bills, and we take action. Or not we, the staff takes action, right? Sending contracts out to bid, pressure testing assumptions, changing assumptions, you know, changing the, the, the terms of the contract. And it really has been, just in my year on the board, very impressive to me what the staff does to address 
what happens with our costs. And uh, it's a very proactive, it's a very um, specific, and there's a lot of detailed steps that get, take, that get taken to try to keep our costs under control. And uh, I appreciate the work the staff has done to, to make that happen. You know, and it, it, it needs to be, have the light shine on it because it's too easy to make a statement that I can take 5% off the top. I just have the stuff off the bid, which just isn't true. So a lot of hard work has gone into this budget and, and the actions the staff has taken on all of our expenditures, whether it's paper contracts, computer contracts, transportation contracts. It's, it's just really impressive. So I want to say thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments from board members? Here or not, I ask for a motion and a second to approve the resolution to adopt the 2018-19 budget. As uh, part of the Finance Committee, uh, I would hope that we can make that motion and uh, second it uh, for, the, for the benefit of the board. Moved by Mr. Matheson and seconded by Mr. Gambiano. Mrs. Hutchison, would you please call the roll? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Mrs. Erickson? Yes. Mr. Hamlin? Yes. Mr. Paulson? Yes. Mr. Roman? Yes. The motion to approve the resolution to adopt the 2018-19 budget has been approved. And I move to oral reports. And the first one is social and emotional learning update. Dr. Schuller? So, Dr. Uh, Salaki is going to give the board uh, an update on uh, one of the priorities that you've clearly identified both in the strategic plan and I think the priorities you've set for, for this year. Um, and this, this presentation or update will kind of then lead us into um, affirming if the, the board interest is in creating kind of an oversight committee specifically for SEL that was brought up at the last meeting that we wanted to address that tonight, but I thought we ought to put a little context to where we are with SEL um, before we have that discussion. So, Dr. Sluggy. Thank you, Dr. Shuler. Uh, members of the Board of Education, first just wanted to uh, express uh, my excitement and um, feeling an honored to lead social emotional learning in our district. So, um, I'm very, very humbled by that opportunity and feel passionately about it. Um, I hope to really to uh, one, give you an update on the status of social emotional learning within our district right now, right? And then also hopefully clarify or talk about where we're headed, the potential roadmap for social emotional learning within our district. And then lastly, answer any questions that you may have. So let's start with where we are, right? We couldn't have had a better start uh, to talk about social emotional learning as Dr. Melvin and the students uh, really celebrated the spirit of social emotional learning. And, and I think that that is pretty consistent across our district. We have leaders and teachers and kids embracing social and emotional learning, which is a really, really good thing. Um, where are we right now? Um, we've started standards implementation. There was work last year um, across all levels to really map out some work of covering social and emotional learning standards. Additionally, our students are applying social and emotional learning skills. Um, that application of skills, you just saw that as we talked about our student council and the service learning that we're doing. When Mrs. Dalton talks about the fit learning environment, when you think of contextualized learning, problem-based learning, real-world learning, when we talk about full curriculums, that's all the application of social and emotional learning skills we have. Also in our district, we've seen an increase in professional learning opportunities for our staff. Um, most notably and most recent, week of learning. Many of the learning opportunities correlated to social and emotional learning and were delivered by our teachers. Additionally, micro-credentials is a new learning opportunity within our district. Um, all of those micro-credentials either correlate to FIT or SEF. Um, one piece that I think is really, really important for us to know is that our principals, our human resources department, is extremely diligent in hiring emotionally intelligent people. We put that at the highest priority. And what we know is when we put emotionally intelligent staff in front of kids, the social emotional learning experience increases. That, that's giving us a leg up already. We have high retention rates, and we really seek to hire people that have a high level of emotional intelligence. And that's a success in our district, and that's a consistency in our district. Um, and, and lastly, uh, where are we? Uh, maybe the backbone of, of the work in District 200 is the relationships that we have with our students. Teacher to student and student to student. 
Um, and what that really leads to is school connectivity. And this is of the utmost importance. School connectivity not only influences learning, but it is also preventative against harmful behavior, violence, and, and, and other issues down the road. So this is where we are, and this is a good place. I can tell you also in my time in this role, as myself and my colleagues have sat down with every principal, I can tell you with the utmost confidence that every leader sitting in our buildings value social emotional learning. They value the whole child. Um, so that's that's a really good thing. Um, but we know always that we can get better, that we can improve, that there's ways to get better and grow. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. Um, so where are we going? Uh, highlighted a lot of the good things that are happening within the district in SEL. However, um, there's a need to develop a comprehensive SEL framework that encompasses all of our work in the social emotional learning landscape. And, and it's pretty comprehensive. And, and why a framework, and when I use the word framework, I'm really speaking of a blueprint um, that would identify essential components that encompass all and everything in SEL. This would clearly communicate an SEL vision, not only within our district, but to our community. Um, by developing a framework, it gives you an opportunity to identify the strengths, the good things that are happening in all of our buildings and all of our levels, but it also allows us to identify opportunities for improvement and growth in this area. And, and lastly, as you identify the strengths and the opportunities, you then can solidify a more systematic approach, which guarantees a high floor for every kid, social emotional learning ones. So what would be in an SEL framework um, if we were to bring one of the to it? And you'll see up here I use the word potential SEL framework components. And the reason I use the word potential is um, these components cannot just come from me. They need to be reviewed, um, advised, we need to get input from our stakeholders. And I'll talk a little bit about that process on the next slide. But I also want to give you at least perspective on what type of components would encompass the total world of social emotional learning. Okay? And without sounding repetitive, I'm going to start with relationships. Right? Um, student to student relationships, teacher to student relationships, and school connectivity has to be a part of your social emotional learning framework because of the influence on learning and because of the protective piece that it gives our kids. Additionally, when I say mindset, I really mean growth mindset. I think of this in two areas. I think about our teacher mindset, which is a belief in all kids, the belief that all kids can learn at high levels through hard work, through perseverance, through grit, and then the hope and, and, and the, the will that that will transfer to our students so that they have a growth mindset. So that they know that their brain is valuable, that, that through their efforts, their hard work, through perseverance, they can grow and learn. Why would this be a part of an SEL framework? Because we know growth mindset is essential, not only for school success, but for life success. The heart of a framework has got to be learning. Talk a little bit about standards implementation, right? Um, there's a lot of ways to cover standards when we think about SEL. The social emotional learning standards are only one part of social emotional learning, but they're important, right? So, how do, we, how do we cover standards? Well, they can be directly taught. We've got some curriculum. You've heard a little bit about that tonight, but they can also be applied in different learning environments, different contexts, service learning, co-curricular. But at the heart of, uh, of a framework development, learning would certainly be a part of that. Preventative practices. Really what we're looking at here is, is talking about how are we being proactive and protective for our kids from a mental health perspective. Right. And obviously this looks different at every level, and it is dependent upon the needs of the students. Um, and there are certainly really good things happening in our district, but again, when we look at a framework, we want to look at this with a systematic guide. And the last piece that could potentially be in an SEO framework would be foundational practices. As you walked into Lowell today, you may have seen posters up that highlighted expectations for the hall. You see one right over here for lunchroom expectations. These are really guidelines for success, for behavior, how you act and can be successful in school. Um, they also, foundational practices, encompass classroom management, all those kind of behavioral pieces. So when we talk about potential components of an SEL framework, 
This is trying to be broad and encompass everything as yet. But again, those, those components are potential because our work has to be collaborative, right? So over this month, over next month, um, I will obviously be working with a lot of stakeholders. I um, already started with our elementary principals um, to lay out some of these components, get feedback, get input, um, working closely to share these um, components with our leadership members. Um, we have SEL teams that will start meeting in early October that will be a part of this work and an integral part of this work. And then our department heads, everybody that would be involved in that department piece from our social workers, workers to our psychologists to our teachers. Once you have a framework set up, though, really all it is is a framework. It's a, it's a blueprint. And, and, and the goal is, is any good work happens is you build co capacity to take action, right? So when a framework's aligned, this then allows you to identify the successful practices that are happening um, district-wide in all of our schools in alignment to the framework components. But then it allows you also to analyze and identify gaps in practice, right? When you identify those gaps, you can then say, all right, where do we need to get better at? Where do we want to be more systematic at? From there, you can set a resource analysis. So determine what instructional materials you need, what professional training will be needed, and, and where there are opportunities for assessment in different areas. So timeline for this, kind of timeline on here, it's specific months. But really within fall, we, we should be solidifying our framework components. Um, and then working through that collaborative process with the stakeholder groups that I mentioned before to inventory our practices. Winter, spring two, 2019, start that gap in resource analysis. Um, and then in the spring, start identifying um, our needs for the framework implementation. Um, develop a professional learning plan that's, that's even tighter to some of those framework components, and then continue that collaborative work process. Um, I'm going to stop right here because um, as I vision cast, I think it's important for me, again, to be working with all of our teams, but I wanted to give you kind of a glimpse into the, uh, into the future of, of some of these things. Take any questions? Chris, can you talk a little bit about I had the um, pleasure of serving in Lakers last year, year and a half on the SEL design team. Can you talk a little bit about a couple of things? First off, um, explicitly teaching in context. I, I, I had the opportunity to go to a few schools and observe anywhere from PE to, to math to English. Targets are on the board that's woven into daily lessons. Can you, that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, secondly, um, with this with this framework that we're that we're putting together, I think one of the things that if you could also share about as well, when when the design team get got together, it was everything from our uh, early learning all the way through high school in the same room and being able to watch that spiraling happen. But I want to make sure too that some of our schools have that the autonomy that some of our schools have had in the success that they've, they've also had along the way that, that we're not stifling that with a curriculum or we're going to allow. So could you share a little bit about that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Good questions. So I'm going to start with the first one, which is, is the learning question, right? And really the question was, how is that happening when we talk about standards implementation? Right from that. Um, and it, it would be right on really with, with, with kind of what you've observed, right? The teaching of social emotional learning standards can happen in a direct fashion through a direct lesson. So that could be a second step type lesson, it could be a lesson where there's a real out and reflection. Uh, this may be sometimes more common at our younger grades where we want to expose our kids to some direct skills or vocabulary pieces. Um, you see it at a higher level when our teachers are integrating it into their practice, where they are being very cognizant and mindful of the social emotional learning competency that can be woven into a lesson, um, and, and then they're having kids close and reflect on maybe a particular competency, whether it's relationship skills, whether it's self management, management, managing their emotions, um, communicating or persevering through something, right? Um, you also could have within that learning piece, and talk a little bit about the competitive practices piece, we have some schools that have well, uh, maybe a, a wellness series where they're covering the standards there and they're using a mixture of teachers and some specialists to cover those standards. 
So when you talk about the coming, those standards have to drive your contents. Is that good? First question. Second question was how do we um, utilize our teams and how do we kind of continue that work, right? So um, coming into this role, there, there's really um, there's two teams, three total teams that are working on SCLs to be contents. There's an SEL design team, so this is up to 2018, up to June 2018. There's an SEL design team which is encompassed uh, early childhood all the way through 12 weeks. Yeah. Additionally, there was a what we would call an MTSS behavioral team for elementary, MTSS behavioral for middle school. These were the teams that were kind of tasked with some SEL work. And, and some good work is certainly happening in those teams. Um, moving forward, if you think about a framework, I want to keep all those people in play. But for a starting point, within October, we will have we will bring everybody from that MTSS team, everybody from that SL design team, into one elementary team, and then one sixth through twelfth grade team, bringing a few more high school people on board as well, and hold two separate meetings as we solidify our framework. Uh, once that framework is solidified, what I what I envision is breakout teams from that team to work on specific frameworks specific components, right? We know that in foundational practices there's work to happen for behavioral intervention in some of those pieces. That MTSS team already has this team going. They'll probably break out and keep some work going there. Um, with the thought that there will be opportunities to bring everybody back together, K-12. Um, third question was how do we get buildings on time? Completely agree with you. Um, when you think about the, the best work that's happening, it's because it's, ha it's happening organically, it's happening naturally, it's happening through leadership, people that are um, passionate about SEL. We want to keep that going. And, and probably all the more reason to solidify a framework to identify the successful practices to keep those going, right? While also letting other schools see, while that school's doing that, we want to try that. Or we should be doing that, right? So um, I think with anything, we really want to frame some tight loose expectations around work. What are things that are absolute non-negotiables that have to happen? And what are the other things that we really want our builders to have all time around and have an envision our framework really clearly communicating that and, and never really any of our buildings. So, um, I don't think that any of our buildings have been limited just from a principal's perspective. Um, sky is the limit of what you can take and do with that scenario. One more question. So, uh, from what I've witnessed, elementary it, it, it's pretty stable in, in, in a lot of buildings. How are we in terms of middle school and high school, where it, it's a little more difficult because it's you're not with the same set of students every single time to be able to kind of I don't want to say which one to be able to monitor that that, the, um, that it's being interwoven everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I think that there are. Some obviously uh, markets where there's a high level of social emotional learning happening, and it may not be happening at high levels at other places. Uh, all the more reason for us to consistently put together a framework to identify what we value, what we prioritize. Um, I can tell you in my short time in this role that um, there are people at every one of our middle and high schools that value, embrace, and are teaching the standards, embracing the standards taking out the of the practices, those things are happening. Um, however, however, we want to be systematic in some of those pieces, right? We don't want to leave things to chance. And, and again, my, my answer to that would be, we need to identify all the successful practices together with everybody in the room, and then find the gaps, and then move forward. Um, because you're right, it's kind of a, a bigger piece, and, and and the risks get higher as we go, as we go higher in grades, and that's why we want to take it seriously in that room. Okay. Uh, two quick questions. One is, um, I think the last time we looked at our dashboard was in June, and I don't think you were really on board yet back then. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I meant to think, well, you have or haven't, uh, but you would say to collaborate on the one metric we're going to put on our dashboard related to SEL, and that's the five or the state five essentials data. 
does that line up with the framework of your zone? Is it adequate? Maybe we need to revisit that a little bit. That's, that's one thing on the dashboard. The second point, I guess it's the point, first question. Um, on your first page, your point about emotional intelligent hires, I couldn't agree more. That's so huge. It's just, it's, it's huge. It makes such a difference uh, you know, with our teams. Uh, is, is emotional intelligence uh, part of our micro credentialing? Is it something that a, a, a person could participate in or learn through a micro credential as well? So um, I'll take, I'll start with the micro credential piece first. Um, many of our micro credentials focus their competency base, and they definitely have components of emotional intelligence and social emotional learning. Um, so could somebody become more emotionally intelligent through the micro credentialing process? I think it's fair to say that um, simply by embracing social. I would say in that same breath, one of the reasons why we're so diligent about the people that we hire is because we know some of those innate emotional, relational skills, some of them are really innate, some of them are more innate. Um, so um, I think it's kind of what happens. The uh, first question to you, there's more definitely. Yeah, um, so I, two pieces to that. Do I think that just the five essentials can be the only way that we can assess social emotional learning. Probably, um, maybe from a dashboard perspective, that may be one way to think about total assessment of social emotional learning. I think there's got to be other pieces that go into that because the variability of that may be helpful. Um, and there's a lot of different measures you can look at from being survey based with students, creating your own surveys, and some of our report card data at the elementary level. There's probably a lot of Thank you. Thank you. That uh, question. The, uh, you mentioned you met with the elementary principals, okay? So there is a different standard at the high school and middle school that you'll be designing. Yeah. Um, I would envision, now I have not uh, presented to middle school principals, I have not presented to high school principals, their meetings are, are later this month, and then obviously the SEL team as well in some cases. Um, I have met with our, with our social work department chair principal as well, so she has the components of the framework. Um, while the practices and the standards may change, the components of a framework, uh, on first blush, I don't know if those would change. Um, I hate to compare some of this to the FIT framework, but when you think about the FIT learning environment, the components don't change. The practice may change depending on the level of our audience. But the components, we talk about relationships, preventative practices, foundational practices, learning. Goals are essentially C12. What happens is different. Okay, and then, you know, I historically, and I, I think it's a reflection of our community as well, but, you know, I've always heard at a football game, a show choir event, as we interact with other schools, how well we are regarded in this field. Right? And, and I, I guess that begs the question do other schools address this? Are we pioneers in this? Uh, uh, do we gain insight from others? A little bit of everything, yes. Uh, I would say that our surrounding districts definitely address social emotional learning. Absolutely. Um, I think that we are doing it at a high level as a result of a wonderful school community, um, wonderful leaders, wonderful teachers, um, and, and some good work that's, that's been started. So um, I think it's a combination, but uh, my perspective would be the same. I would share that about our kids here in Wheaton elementary, middle, and high school. It's pretty special. Um, I think it's a combination of all those. But uh, are all the districts addressing this? Absolutely, right? Um, I also think when you think about us turning out students, it's a combination of our work in our schools and the work of, of the school community and families as well. And I guess the last one, we just kind of hit on the topic of the, how, how do we, you know, the, the kids learn from attending school and they learn from their parents. Do we, in any way incorporate the parents into this process? Yeah, yeah I think, I, one, I would say there is definitely um, parent involvement already in the social emotional learning process. There is, um, when you think about the development of a framework and identifying practices, I think we're going to uncover some of those things happening already. Um, I think when we think about involving families, it's going to happen at two levels, depending on the practice or the component of an SEL framework. When you think 
about mental health awareness in some of those pieces. The, uh, the family comes in pretty, pretty serious there, right? Actually, uh, you think about harmful behaviors to a student, the family, actually, the family connectedness ranks above the school connectedness. Uh, most of your data shows school connectedness, actually, Trump's family connectedness, but on that one, the family connectedness pieces. There. So the family's going to be a part of that component. Um, it's just going to vary at different levels because we also want to make sure, you know, as we work with our staff and, and we definitely have this mindset, we have to focus on what we can control with our kids during the time we have them. Well, still understanding those outside factors, but we've got to honor the time we have with them and keep our focus on what we can do with our kids as well. Chris, can I piggyback on Jim's question? So, what about our parents' series? Is our parents' series aligning with? our SEL direction that we're, that we're heading? Um, I think components of it are. Eric and I have talked a little bit about that. There's just some open slots to, to consider some of those pieces as we talk about reducing anxiety and some of those other topics. Um, so we've tried to have a spin that always connects to social emotional learning. And if you kind of look at some of those pieces, yes, it's there, but are we 100% there? No, and do we need to be 100% there? I don't know because sometimes there are topics that may have some social emotional learning connection, but they may be just very relevant for parenting, but might not have a direct topic. You know. um, but Eric and I have certainly spoken about that and how we can continue to try and connect those goals moving forward. Chris, uh, yeah, that's a Chris, on the um, SEL framework alignment, uh, you talk about identifying successful practices and then gap analysis. Uh, how, how, what's the plan? How do you, you can't have a gap analysis unless you have some measurements, right, and some tools to calculate uh, against the, the framework or the goal, if you will? And can you, maybe you're not ready to answer that, but can you describe a little bit about how that involves when you finally get some data and then you create the gap? Uh, to find out where's the shortfall, how, how's that being tracked and, and, and determined? Yes, yeah. yeah. The, the initial process of identifying successful practices um, is, is actually the first kind of rough data point. It's not really a number or a percentage, it's really what is the practice that's happening that correlates to that component. And because our buildings have autonomy, which is a good thing, um, I envision us really building out everything we're doing correlative to that correlates to that component. When you kind of look at all the practices or all the things that are happening, then you can look at it with an eye and say, where are gaps right now in actual practice? So the first piece of data is going to be, what are all the practices? What's the fidelity of those? Where are the ones that we're comfortable with them be more homegrown? Or the ones where we say, we've got to have some fidelity and some research base to this, some real context to this. So the first piece of that before we even get into assessment is what is the practice and that's going to give you your first gap. I have a question for you um, We see a lot of the, this kind of thing that we heard about here at Lowell and, and in the elementary school. Are we teaching any kind of explicit curriculum to our middle school and high school students through our counseling and our social work departments? Um, so what I can tell you is that there are talks of that certainly happening, that at our middle schools they have planned out uh, a three-year plan for covering different standards um, with some autonomy in there and letting our students have some voice on to what are some pressing issues that are happening with them. Uh, so the first answer that would be, is it a specific curriculum across all middle schools? No, we're not using a standardized scripted curriculum. Um, some experts will say that you have to do that. Others say that you don't, right? At the high school level, um, again, there are efforts for kind of that preventative practice. We South has what they call South, uh, South level students. They not only look at the standards, um, but they kind of dig much deeper into some of the mental health anxiety, depression. They have teachers and outside therapists and community um, specialists cover this ninth through twelfth grade with all of their kids. So is this happening? Yes. Um, will a framework and a gap analysis allow us to point it on where it's not? Yes. 
Yeah, so more, the more comments than questions, um, I would say of, of all the issues we deal with, I think personally I'm most energized about this issue. Um, you know, I was volunteering at an event this weekend and I happened to be with a school board member of one of our neighboring districts and, and we were talking about stress and anxiety. And this is getting down to the elementary school level. <laughs> you know, this, this, is, this is such a big issue within, I guess, our, our world, <clears throat> certainly within the community that um, I, I feel very strongly that this is the most important thing we want to do over the next long period of time, but certainly in this year. Chris and I were the ones who kind of brought this idea of having a, a dedicated SEL committee at least for a year while, while we go through this process, but um, uh, we want to reaffirm that our interest in doing in doing that. A um, couple of comments. We had a couple of conversations here about data or questions about data, but I think it's important to remember that SEL is very personal. It's about kids and their own individual experiences. So data informs maybe our plans, but all the all the instruction has to be very personal and how that's uh, absorbed by the student. A little anecdotal information I, I happen to go through. Uh, Edison's middle school's curriculum night um, a couple weeks ago, and there were three three things that I observed in that curriculum night that were all SEL driven. So I was very pleased to see this. First, they uh, they're creating an advisory period where they they get small groups of students, and like I think about eight or nine times a year they break up, they break, they change the day schedule, and they actually meet with a, 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 the same teacher and they talk about SEL issues for like a twenty. 25 minute period. So that's how one particular school is having autonomy to, to look into this issue. As I went through class to class to class, every teacher talked about SEL. Every marker board had posters on that. You know, I was certainly hearing that from a different lens. I'm, I'm not sure all the other parents that really is attuned to this as part of our curriculum that uh, maybe I was sitting as a parent at the end of the school board member. Um, so that, that was a Refreshing for me to see. I think um, you know. I think back in April, I talked about some <clears throat> experience I had going to a conference and how I believe that you know we won't as you mentioned we have kids for seven hours a day, and a lot of their experience as children growing up are shaped by other experiences in you know in the community, uh, in the you know in the soccer team, the football team, etc. Um, in the home. I really feel like whatever we're going to do over the next long period of time can be so much bigger than just how we use that SEL in the curriculum. And that's one of the things I want to really try to push and explore with the, the, edge, the, the experts. I'm certainly not an expert, but um, I can bring some ideas and try to push some ideas and, and, and try to get the team thinking even bigger. Because I, I, like I said, I think this is such a huge issue that um, we just have to keep on. It's, it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away. It's, it's just going to get worse. So, thank you. And you got ready. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Chris, thank you very much. Good presentation. Thank you. The next oral report is the review of the 2018 summer projects. Dr. Schuller. Yep, thank you. So uh, this really actually is kind of also serving as a facility committee uh, report. So the facility committee met last week and one of the items that they reviewed in addition to projected agenda for this year was the work recently completed. You do not have a paper copy of this presentation because it's largely visual and, and so we, we just didn't make uh, paper copies for you, but if you direct your attention to the uh, the screen, JR is going to walk you through uh, the work that was completed this summer with kind of some visuals to give you a sense of uh, all of those uh, opportunities. So, uh, and let, let me just again, uh, I, I want to offer two huge uh, uh, thank yous as a part of, of this discussion. One, uh, obviously, a thank you to the board for the work you did to prioritize this work over the summer. Uh, the fact that Jared's going to walk you through all of the completed secure entries, the highest 
projecting capital stuff absolutely shows that you are very responsive to the feedback you received from the community and the way you went about prioritizing and getting this work done. So thank you um, for that. And then second, uh, just a, a huge public thank you to, uh, to JR and to Bill. We have a very tight construction window in school districts when you talk about summer, and, and it seems like over time, Brad probably knows this, it almost feels like that window just keeps shrinking in the amount of time you have. This is 19 major projects completed over really what amounts to about an eight-week window that you have to, uh, to get this done. Uh, and the reality is, well, it represents really, really, really amazing work. The fact that you as a board weren't aware of or made aware of significant issues or messes that had to be cleaned up at the end of the summer tells you what was done to, to monitor those projects. So this is a lot of organization and close out to get 19 projects done. So anyway, huge thank you to JR and Bill for your oversight on that. And JR, show is yours. Thanks. Um, just wanted to add that uh, Mr. Paulson mentioned earlier that um, this work wasn't developed this summer, it started last fall. And really it started five years ago when I hired him. I truly, truly, truly appreciate working for a district that, that really uh, appreciates um, long-term thought. We started Bill, Bill and uh, Paul said he started with a capital plan, which we put together and presented. And through meetings with the finance team and the facility committee, uh, we generated a master facility plan, and that's kind of a blueprint for what we've been doing, so that's, that's where we're at today, and it's, it's, it's a great work for an organization that thought we had, so. A lot of exciting stuff this summer. Get ready to get this on. Yeah. So, um, this past summer's projects were bid out and approved, and we did uh, work in secure entries, flooring, cut pointing, taking concrete work, and HVAC work. And that told $3.8 million. And that does not include architect and engineering fees. That's the work that we uh, completed this summer. We also did $166,000 in security. Um, all this work was done, completed on time, and on budget. I'll go through this building fairly quick, um, and we'll take questions at the end. So the power, on the right side is, top right you see a security entry project. It's a very large project. Um, we can take a movie from one side of the uh, entry to the other. Um, we did a master flooring project where we took, we took out the remaining carpet that was left in the building, and we did not do during the great flood a decade or so. so uh, and then we reconfigured the library and painted it. And it was great to be down there. It's a, it's a wonderful building. Everson, uh, we tuck pointed the back, the east part of the building, um, the original part of the building, did the whole side. It's the side that's weathered the most, and uh, it was a need of a tuck point of that. So it turned out great. For Johnson, we, uh, we did a secure entry. Pardon, come right here. Right there. Um, go to New Florida. And uh, this is the final um, build out. There's, there's furniture and stuff around. It looks really nice. It's very functional. And then, if you recall, several years ago, we paved the back lot. And this year, we completed the rest of the paving the whole lot. And it's the entirety of the paving. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe the project was the secure entry. Um, it looks like it fits in the building like it's always been there. It did a nice job of designing it and developing it and executing the work. We also put in a uh, new HVAC system for the office and uh, there's a great deal of comfort to the office staff. And uh, the one thing I didn't put out here that I failed to mention is that when we walked in today, you saw uh, a lot of new concrete around. Walks and the stairs are used, um, new uh, railings and new stairs that, that, that stair well used quite a bit by morning kids going to school, so that was a welcome addition. Pleasant Hill. Secure entry. Good five. 
Um, one of the interesting things about the secure entry plus the LLC, that's the standard, is that we're using card access system for the first time with buildings. Uh, Rod and I work diligently with our engineers and architects to come up with a system we think we like, and we're hoping to expand it further in the other buildings, so we're hoping this works out well for us, so far it has. Um, but that secure entry project turned out great. We uh, resurfaced the gym floor. All popping up and greatly needed there too. And then we did um, the parking lot and the, uh, well, the entire parking lot, and most of the concrete around the building. You have to get up there. But number one, you really need to be done. And it looks great. Sandberg, the secure entry project, like I mentioned previously, we, we put car access to get uh, the staff and students through the hallway. and. Uh, you walk in here, you can't even go to it wasn't there in first place. So it doesn't provide us one security. Washington was one of my favorite projects. Um, it started with the, with the uh, secure entry project here in the bottom. But then uh, Principal Craig talked to Bill and I months before this, and they got a, they got a huge generous donation from the PTA to reconfigure their library. And we took the opportunity to assist in that, and that the library flooring was all carpet. It was the last carpet, in, the last piece of carpet in the school. We took the opportunity to get rid of that carpet. Uh, we painted the entire thing. It's gray and blue. Um, it, and this is the old paint. It looks beautiful. The new furniture they got there looks beautiful. The library is totally transformed. I'm sure we get an addition Whittier was one of our, this probably the second biggest project we had at the Valor. As the security for those, um, it turned out really well, uh, better than I could imagine. Um, so we, this is the side where they come in from the front. This is the show of the from the This is from the street. We struck. We uh, have had some problems with flooding in the past uh, many times, and it started with this parking lot here on the bottom left. Clogged up and fill up, and then the water would run into the school right here. So, when it, it allowed us in that shape, and so is so the, uh, the, the playground lot above. So, we took the opportunity to redo um, a lot of work with our engineers. We figured out a way to bring the water from up top where the playground is and around. And instead of having the um, lower step up to the, uh, to the sidewalk that goes to the floor right here, we moved it down up there. And then we dug out the grass. So now the water flows around, around here, and out the school, out the side. And if the uh, drains in the parking lot were to clog and fill up a lot, um, we would not get water in our school. And in fact, we've had a good amount of rain in the last couple weeks, and we've been watching it. We'll go down and the semi night guys watch and take videos. You'll see the water just flow right by. Very heavy. At Edison, a uh, secure entry project. See where they, they come inside here. The camera system, the, so the, the ladies in the office can see who's coming in and let them, before we let them in. Um, he has a security camera, like I mentioned earlier, to all the middle schools. And several years ago, we did the parking lot in the front of the school, and we completed uh, this west side and the east side drive on the other side. And we also had a water main that ran down this. And we've had four breaks on the past five years. That was lots of problems for us. So we took the opportunity and we dug this out to replace the water main. Franklin, um, a couple of interesting things happened with Franklin. We, uh, we had a security system, um, but we, uh, we had a problem in the back with uh, a cave wall that was crumbling and falling down at the end of there. And the paving was portion. So we took the opportunity to uh, remove that retaining wall, move it back about 30 feet, uh, build a new retaining wall, we see the retaining wall back in on the north side as well. And we were able to add 13 spots, parking spots that now are not on the street, but in our property. We picked up another spot on the east side 
as we strike it and uh, configure the handicap spots. They actually did put a handicap spot too on this side, uh, and so this lot was done as well. Uh, the fun indication I mentioned here is that this lot, actually both lots, um, had high curves and what act as um, retention basement, if you will, during the flood season that will, that will help out the surrounding neighbors. On the road, uh, camera system. We north, uh, thanks to the harbor for the board and the committees, we uh, got an show to put in. Um, Please say that the first time over here, we got pulling and we north. And uh, it's a great shoulder, it's a four stage shoulder. This doesn't mean anything new, but what it means to me is that it runs very efficient. It can run a quarter, half, three quarters, or, or, or the full thing, depending on load. It runs very quiet. And in the normal south, we appointed basically the second floor of the uh, auditorium area. That's it. Are there any questions? anecdote tied to a couple of these uh, pieces. So I don't know when it was, Bill, maybe two years ago, that uh, I got a call from Bill in the morning, which is never a good sign. So when Bill calls my cell phone anytime before 7 a.m., I'm always bracing for what the news is going to, to be. And it happened to be a day that uh, Weesbrook had flooded. And so, you know, Bill said, you better, you better you know, get here on your way in because we've got to evaluate if we're going to be able to clean and open this building in time, and so as so we were down there, and JR's guys were madly cleaning, and, and anybody that was available, you know, with a, a mop or a, you know wet vac system, I was running one of the end of the wet vacs in the hallway. But here's a great sign of security because one of our teachers that just retired last year came up as I was running the wet vac and said, "Can I see your ID? I don't really know who you are. Why are you running this wet vac in my uh, in my hallway in a suit?" Uh, and and so, so our security procedures work, but no longer do we get the pleasure of an early morning flood at the show. I got to Just a, a couple of comments, JR. Your, your, your pictures don't do all that work. I mean, there was so much work that was done this summer. And, and I, when, when Dr. Schuler mentioned eight weeks, it, that's, that's amazing. And um, I had the pleasure of to, Dr. Salagi took me on a tour of Whittier. It's my, was my home for 11 years and wow that's all I can say I was one of those teachers right up at the top of the stairs and you know it always was a little unnerving that those doors didn't lead into an office and you know we got rid of those three stairs I, I think that once we get into the buildings as board members too we'll even get more of an appreciation for all that you did and a little shout out to Erica because all summer long you had that pink hard hat on your head and you were sharing with the community so appreciate all those updates um, that you gave and and that chiller at Meeting North saves me a text every day from my daughter telling me how hot it is there so thank you for, for, for that also. Any other comments from questions from board members? Two quick questions. Uh, number one, the, the um, secure entries was a kind of a separate cost we talked about for a while. And then, then we have our category one, two, and three. Would you say that most of the other two million that was spent was category one? Or, okay. And and what would you say is the? And I, I'm sure we'll be working on this in more detail. But how much category one kind of immediate need are we looking at, say, for this next summer? A lot. <laughs> um, I'll start with the category one. We are working right now. Finding the master facility plan, the initial ones, year one, two, three. Um, we met with the, the facilities team. Finance team is next. And uh, I don't really have a number yet, but we're working on it. It's, it was, as we know, from the past five years. Okay, and we do most of this work. Now, you were obviously overviewing this work, but we hire the contractors and, and so on. And you coordinate and overview what they're doing as well. Some of the work we did for a general contractor, most of it we did direct it to us, so it was save money. And Much more money. cost efficient, yeah. So if we were to need to do eight million work in next summer, which kind of our you know our our funding plan looks at, is that practically doable? Yeah. 
Um, it's, it's really the Kentucky amount of work, it's the type of work I'm doing $50,000, dollars job, that's a lot of work. If I'm doing eight on million dollar job, it's much easier to do. So it's, it's, it's kind of on the mix. And when we look at roofs, we, we've been doing roofs now, instead of, we have 30 sections of roof, 80 sections of high school. Instead of doing three at a time, we group up big chunks, we get better costs, better value for the, for the work, and it's, it's easier to do. I, I will offer this though, just because uh, JR is not going to say it, but one of the things that I've certainly challenged to, to JR and I'll share with the board is that um, as we evaluate work that needs to happen, and then really you have to look at what are the projects and what's the oversight. And so, well, JR will work himself ragged to save the, the board those costs and oversight. I've asked him as we move forward though that we do a careful analysis of whether we can truly always oversee that or obviously in some circumstances we're going to need to either use general contract or construction management to, to help us with that because uh, again you know we want to be as efficient as we can with community dollar but we also obviously want to make sure that we've got enough oversight of all of the the, the project. So just because he did it that way this summer does not necessarily mean moving forward that we won't at times take a different path and use construction management to help us with that as well. Do we have a timetable for the uh, re regrouping, I'll call it, of the project plan? And what would that be? We do actually. Rob or Brad, do you want to kind of talk about that from the facilities committee? I can do it. Um, so we, <laughs> you know, we, we are working with, uh, I think, to bring a plan back to the Finance Committee for review in October, not Finance, Facilities Committee in October. So process, we want to make sure Facilities Committee really kind of lays out what should be done over the next three years to address the balance of the Condition 1 capital pieces that will then come to finance committee to look at basically cost by year and how do we put those variables together. Uh, so this past year we did about $4.2 million of total capital improvement cost include, which included some money to move from fund balance. So that's, that's a, I think, if you look historically what we've done, part of that conversation, you realize that that's a great, great capital work over the summer, so be able to keep that up and, and kind of budget that going forward is going to be critical. Um, um, I'm sure that either Jim Mathis or I will mention in, the, in every meeting possible that all this work was included in the rough run last April. Um, so we, we, despite the fact that the community did not support the bond election, we still saw the need to go ahead and do this work. Um, the other thing that uh, I want to make sure we reinforce is that it's pretty unique, I think, especially for school districts our size. We have all 20 of our schools that now have secure entrances. Um, I think that's a great story with a good message. I can tell you that now all school districts are able to say that, that every one of their schools have a secure entrance. So I think we've kind of made a great decision. Uh, security doesn't start and end at that, at that main entrance, but it's certainly an important first step. As, as you kind of look forward into the and we talked about paving, we talked about the secure entrances. Could you kind of put in the major, major buckets the types of work, not the dollars, but the types of work that you're probably most focused on over the next two, three, four years that we're going to be seeing as a board as, as the key priorities? Yeah. Um, mechanical work is always big. Those HVAC controls. Um, flooring. Um, roofs. They didn't want to break the chain. Uh, we want to keep the kids dry and comfortable. And that's part of our mission statement. So those are the big pockets. And my floor is to our community union, the remaining company that does exist to, yes. as part of that effort. Yes, sir. This one other thing I'd, I'd like to kind of add to it is I haven't seen the library in Washington. But if you recall, that was an integral part of our facility master plan that was created. So I'm very interested in, in maybe having the Washington staff and students kind of report back on not just what the space looks like, but how are they using it, what are they able to do now that they weren't able to do before, 
I think that's uh, maybe something if I can look back there in Erica, that'd be a great thing to kind of share with our community that it's not just a space, it's a change of a learning opportunity for our students. So that's kind of by default become a pilot. And if we can share those stories out and maybe get those out into other schools, that would be a great, you know, another follow-up from the facility master plan that we created with uh, with our community over the last couple years. And Jen, Jen has certainly shared that story with other buildings, and I've, and I've now watched that begin to get replicated in some other places that are, are doing that work. Just, just by way of a quick reminder to the board, your October meeting is at Bauer. Um, so we've intentionally structured your board meetings to get you out in buildings when we want you to see this work. So October you're at Bauer, November you're at Washington. So I'm confident that will likely be a part of the, the report from that building as well, sharing that piece. Washington is my adopted school. I'm going to be attending the PTA meeting there next week. Uh, I'm sure you know, library learning center, so I'll be able to see firsthand the great work we do. I'm just proud that Washington parents, or PTA, contributed to that total project, and and uh, I, I'm, on one hand, sorry that we have to fund things that way, uh, but, you know, it's a model potentially for other, you know, issues that we're trying to solve, because, you know, I still have a 80-some million dollar back in my mind fix, you know, which is now probably 90 million or something, and, and so on. So, but uh, what was the percentage? Yeah, they're, they're not done, but I believe to date they've raised about $50,000 that's gone into that project. And, uh, and they've kind of completed the first phase of that that involved um, kind of replacing some of the circulation desks, some of the shelving uh, around the space, as well as some flexible seating. And then I think there's another phase that they're, they're working on now. I think that their total target was uh, like 75 so they, they got a big chunk of it uh, underway, which is uh, impressive. Jr., thank you for your report and all the great work you did this summer. The written reports that uh, we reviewed in particular is the monthly financial report, the four-year report, and uh, the teacher and administrative compensation reports. Uh, we have reports from board uh, committee reports. Uh, they were posted on the agenda. Uh, the committees include the Facility Committee, the Finance Committee, and the HR Policy Committee. Is there any supplement to those report to them? Um, yeah, I had put together a, a recap of our HR Policy Committee, but the minutes that were recently posted pretty much capture the gist of our conversations there. I would say that the big piece of our discussion that meeting was a follow-up on policy policy 7.40 on revision and um, bottom line we seem to have come to a consensus that we don't need to tinker with that that policy anymore that it works for us um, and that the, maybe the one remaining item of the question about the district 200 diploma is something that we can um, look at by way of um, a discussion policy, I believe it's 6.300, which is graduation requirements, and then we also talked about how that really probably falls under the domain of the Teaching and Learning Committee, as opposed to the Policy Committee, so we'll end up talking about it there. Um, there's a couple of other policies that need a couple of minor tweaks based on the new language of IHSA regulations, um, but not a big deal there. Um, oh, uh, and then just as a follow-on to policy 7.40, we talked about a couple of um, follow-up pieces, one being a new administrative regulation or procedure, whatever we're calling it, that um, basically for internal use that outlines how we implement that policy so that it actually matches what the policy says and our current practices. And the second piece would be more of an um, external for the public, um, presumably, I guess, a piece that would go on that website that would describe to um, anybody who wants to know um, how it works, um, what our partnership um, protocol would be so that, that there's a way to find that information easily for families that are interested in partnering with us. Um, I think that's, that was kind of the gist of that policy meeting. Um, then are there any reports more, other reports from more board members, Rob? Uh, just a question from Dr. Schuller. Um, during the facilities committee, we talked about 
uh, the request from Senator Nago and Representative Green for showing ready projects who we, we were going to submit to them what we thought was possible. Have you heard any feedback or any response? And I've not heard any feedback. We, uh, we submitted the letters and the requests, um, and just by way of a recap, I don't know if dollars will actually be available, but both of their offices contacted us with candidly a very, very short uh, turnaround, about a 24-hour turnaround, to, to get some, some documentation so that if, in fact, capital dollars became available, uh, that, that they had a list of projects. So it, it coincided well with the facilities committee that we're able to take the capital report so we didn't invent projects. We took the capital report, identified the, the security related projects at uh, the two high schools and submitted that. So I will let you know if we hear anything back. And then topics for future discussion. Is this, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. That's fine. Uh, for other uh, reports from board members, so we've talked about polling places in our schools um, in prior in prior meetings and in follow up with Dr. Schuler. I know Pleasant Hill is still on for this fall, and um, I, I asked, what can we do? So um, Dr. Kyle and I attended um, the public safety forum that Senator Connolly and um, our state attorney um, Barbara Lynn held. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, and um, we brought up the question of what can we do for our schools. Uh, Senator, Con Senator Connolly said he, and I followed up with him after the meeting as well as I was leaving, would be willing to um, sponsor a bill to look at local and state elections possibly being held on, on, on Saturday. And I obviously know that would require a lot of time, so what do we do in the meantime? Number one, I would really like us as a school district and as a board to follow up with Senator Connolly and formally ask him to do so. Um, number two, I would like us to follow up with the Election Commission, and I would like us to do it as, as a school district, as a board, but I'd like us to also contact the other schools and districts in DuPage County that are, that are also polling places. One of the things that Senator Connolly said that I found that was very interesting is they are predicting 35% of the people in this November election will vote through early voting. I look at where I live right now for the past 20 years, the same four polling places are within a mile and a half of my house. If a third of the people are now early voting, why do we need that many polling places? And I would like us to formally ask the Election Commission to explain that and see if they could possibly look at consolidation and move it out of our schools. Um, so I don't know how we go about doing that, but I would like our board and our district to work together with that. I'd like us to work with surrounding districts, and I'd like us to see about getting one places out of our schools. Thank you, Chris. County board is there, too. Uh, topics of future discussion of student learning presentation. Um, on September 26, 2018, we have a committee of the whole meeting. It starts at 7 p.m. at the School Service Center. Our next regular meeting is October 10, 2018, at 7 p.m. at Bauer, as Dr. Stewart just mentioned. Do we have any public comments? I do want to remind all board members that you have a responsibility for your signature on the uh, budget document that uh, Mrs. Hutchison has before you leave tonight. And with that, uh, there being no further action to come before the board open session, I hereby ask for a motion to the second to adjourn the meeting. So moved by Mr. Paulson. Seconded by Mr. Hamlin. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 You opposed, the meeting is hereby adjourned.